for anyone who grew up watching animation in the 2000s, what was the cartoon that you would consider THE cartoon? The one that left a strong impression on you. SpongeBob, Kim Possible, Ed and Eddie, Phineas and Ferb? All right, there's probably too many to count. But if I had to pick one, just one animated series that defined not only my sense of humor, but my taste for the supernatural, the absurd, the dark, and the gritty, it's without a doubt The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Created by Maxwell Adams, this cartooneric series initially premiered as Grim and Evil on August 24, 2001. Each episode comprised of two different segments that represented two different series, The Grim Adventures and Evil Con Carne, before these two shows would split into their own respective series on June 13th, 2003 and July 11th, 2003. While Evil Con Carne had a short lifespan and never really caught on, Billy and Mandy found an audience in no time, captivating viewers of all ages, who embraced the chaotic spectacle warping our feeble minds. Running for nearly six years with 78 Eight half-hour episodes, two TV movies, an action-packed brawler video game, and even a handful of shorts. How could the sheer insanity of the show not pull you in? Brownies that raise the dead? A giant singing alien brain? A sinister, charismatic, jack-o'-lantern-headed prankster and his army of pumpkins? All of that is just season one! Billy and Manny doesn't get enough credit for the weight it pulled. That's not to say it doesn't get any love, it certainly does. But I feel like it's not recognized for being a flagship title, in the same vein as the Powerpuff Girls, Ed and Nettie, Adventure Time, or Regular Show, animated series that are regarded as saviors of the network. When really, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy was just as much of a game changer. Courage the Cowardly Dog set the stage for horror elements and intrinsically dark stories to be present in Cartoon Network productions. But Billy and Mandy took all of that and perfected it. With the Grim Reaper himself serving as a titular character, the show never downplayed the concept of death or shied away from exploring the various circumstances surrounding it. In layman's terms, shit got violent. Like, really violent. It was casual though, you know? Unlike her Cowardly Dog, I wouldn't say Billy and Mandy was ever scary, but it was certainly shocking. Not to mention, the bizarre comedy did a great job of balancing things out. The series utilizing the supernatural to lean way more into the gut-busting humor than the unsettling atmosphere of the early seasons. Yet shaking up that formula didn't hinder the show's quality. It's quality television from start to finish. And just like another childhood cartoon I've been revisiting, codenamed Kids Next Door, it was one of the first Cartoon Network originals to maintain a feeling of continuity and world building. Except for one particular plot point that we will discuss in this video. While the show did hit the reset button quite a bit on an episode to episode basis, it's quite far from a story driven cartoon, it still managed to constantly reward the viewer through twists and turns that further one's investment. Let's not lie to ourselves. We were tuning in for the jokes and mayhem, but the biggest events of the series, like Big Boogie Adventure, Wrath of the Spider Queen, or Keeper of the Reaper work best because of everything that's come before. So it strikes me as odd that a series like Billy and Mandy didn't receive a concrete conclusion. It kind of went out with a whimper. Sure, there's the Underfist Halloween special that technically qualifies as a finale, yet I don't think many people recognize that as the end. It doesn't even focus on Billy, Mandy, or Grimm. It kind of focuses on literally everyone else but them. We don't have any idea on how the story of the Grim Reaper losing a game of limbo and being bound to two misbehaved brats shakes out, and it wouldn't be an issue if the series didn't evolve quite a number of characters or raise the stakes for every major occasion. It's not something you really think about since this was a time where cartoons just sort of stopped. Only a handful of cartoons from this era of animation got to cross the finish line. It wasn't until the 2010s where Cartoon Network shows consistently got an ending. Not to mention, Billy and Mandy never really dangled the idea of an end goal in front of our faces. But hell, if Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends has a definitive ending, why not Billy and Mandy? Some Cartoon Network shows get more than one ending. Adventure Time has one, with a second on the way this year. Samurai Jack has two, thanks to the new video game. Ed and Eddie has an intended half-hour finale in Season 4, and a movie finale. Steven Universe has three! Luckily, it's not too late to remedy this. In an age where just about any recognizable cartoon can get a new installment in their franchise, with Warner Media planning to adopt such notions, I don't think it's completely out of the question for Billy and Mandy to return to the small screen one last time. But I also don't think they'd go for it without fan interest or Maxwell Adams. So today, we're going to check off at least one of those boxes. 
I've given this a lot of thought, and my job today is to convince you, the lovely viewer at home who's trying their best and deserves all the happiness in the world, that Billy and Mandy deserve to embark on one last grim adventure. Addressing the circumstances that brought the series to an end in the first place, the failed spinoff, and how one inconsistent plot thread could serve as the crux of a final story. It's time to talk about why Billy and Mandy deserves an ending. We're back with a vengeance. There's so much ingrained into the DNA of the Grim Adventures that if you remove one element, the whole show falls apart. If you remove the black comedy, it's not Billy and Mandy. If you remove the random humor, it's not Billy and Mandy. If you remove the supernatural forces, the violence, the pessimistic nature of the show, or cynical worldview of the characters, it's not Billy and Mandy. But there's one aspect of the show that I would consider its secret weapon. Something that's not present in every single episode, but has been a part of the show since the very beginning. Character development with an interesting spin. Billy and Mandy themselves are pretty static throughout all seven seasons, which isn't a bad thing. Billy being a brain-dead idiot, and Mandy being a ruthless, controlling mastermind who works in her own self-interest, is a strong part of that aforementioned show DNA. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's everyone else around Billy and Mandy who are constantly evolving in their major appearances. There are so many memorable characters in Billy and Mandy, probably more than most animated series, and the arcs they have are a strong reason why. Again, this show wasn't a stranger to hitting the reset button from episode to episode, which arguably made the growth of the supporting cast stronger. Intentional or not, it conveyed what was important for the audience to remember and what we were just supposed to take at face value turning off our brains for 11 minutes at a time. Billy's mom Gladys is introduced as a loving housewife who's just a little off her rocker, before being driven insane by the Grim Reaper's presence in her home, convinced that Grim has his sights set on Billy, unaware that Grim is bound to Billy and Mandy for all of eternity. Billy's dad, Harold, then sends Gladys off to her sister's house, and she disappears for a bit before returning a few episodes later. When she does return, she presents a calm demeanor while intending to exact revenge on Grimm before reaching an impasse that leads to an uneasy dynamic for the rest of the series. Erwin starts out as Billy's nerdy best friend, who aspires to be cool and earn Mandy's affection. And while that never really changes, the show still goes to great lengths to flesh out his character and family. We learn that his mother is a mummy, and his grandfather is Dracula, making his dad half vampire, and making Erwin himself half mummy quarter vampire. We eventually find out that Erwin was born evil, but his father raised him to be a loving, kind individual, which explains why Erwin is prone to power trips and moments of insanity all throughout the show. Nurgle begins as the main antagonist of the series, but a few episodes later, he falls for Billy's Aunt Sis, marrying her and becoming Billy's in-law relative. And then a few episodes after that, we're introduced to their son, Nurgle Jr., Billy's cousin. Nurgle Jr. ends up enrolling at Billy and Mandy's school. What about Hostel Gatto and Eris? They have nothing to do with each other for a long time, but end up falling in love, dating for a while, before breaking up in chaos theory, due to their relationship bringing too much order to the world, causing adverse effects to reality in the process. What about Nigel Planter and the cast of characters relegated to his episodes? Nigel ages in every appearance he makes in the show, and while yes, it's a clear parody of the Harry Potter franchise, these episodes still kind of become their own thing. Like Dean Toadflat and Squid Hat getting married? And we can't forget about Boogie, who I feel was sort of the replacement for Nurgle as a main antagonist. He's Grimm's old middle school bully who still has it out for Grimm. He gets to play the role as lead villain in the TV movie named after him, Big Boogie Adventure. He ended up being the true villain in Wrath of the Spider Queen through flashbacks. There's no denying that Boogie left a mark on the series. With so many characters obtaining a substantial level of growth, you get why I'm torn up over the lack of a proper conclusion. It just seems like a logical move for the series. Paying off all of these journeys in a story that functions as the cherry on top for Billy, Mandy, and Grimm's own adventure. And with all this talk of continuity, there's one inconsistent variable that's never stayed the same for long in the series. A variable that would be a great hook for a finale. The origins of the Grim Reaper has never really been clear in Billy and Mandy. There is several conflicting accounts on how Grim became the Reaper. It's up to debate if it's even hereditary or not. There are plenty of examples that support both arguments. For the Grim Reaper being a hereditary role, in Billy and the Bully, Grim's mother appears as a silhouette, in the same foreboding robes as Grimm. In Little Porkchop, 
Grimm shows Manny a picture of his old pet skeleton fish, which also depicts Grimm as a preteen in his traditional foreboding black robes. And in a Grimm prophecy, Grimm is shown as having been forced into the role of Grim Reaper by both of his parents. But as for evidence that is not hereditary, in that day afternoon, Grimm is shown as becoming the Grim Reaper after coming across the scythe randomly, unbeknownst to his father, whom Grimm led to believe that he had become a country western rocker. Grimm also says that it's been 1.4 million years since he became the Grim Reaper in this episode. In King Tutankhamun, Grimm muses over his time as an intern for Osiris, god of the Egyptian afterlife, before he became the Grim Reaper. In the episodes Bully Boogie and The Secret Dakota Ring, Grimm is seen in ordinary clothes as a child and not in his black robes. This is elaborated on further in Wrath of the Spider Queen. 137,000 years prior, Grimm was elected Roll of the Grim Reaper by his classmates after they witnessed Grimm standing up to Boogie, which featured a display of his supernatural powers with the scythe. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think this could be spun as a perfect mystery for a finale. Grimm's inconsistent backstory could set the stage for a fun revelation that would be more than just a retcon. But let's put a pin in that for a sec and shift gears to a question everyone has about their childhood cartoons. Why did it get cancelled? So why did Billy and Mandy reach a premature end? Six seasons is nothing to sneeze at. But a show successful enough to have a recurring character become a whole ass mascot for the channel? shouldn't have just stopped, right? Well, that's what happened. And the reasoning behind it is rather dumb. No, it wasn't for being too edgy or violent or anything that deemed the show inappropriate. No, it wasn't because they had Yogi Bear off the shits. It got canceled as a casualty of business. Much like any operation, Cartoon Network has had a roster of leadership throughout the years. From Jim Samples to Christina Miller. Thing is though, when a new president takes over, they have the expectation to build their own legacy. Ensure that their time and power stands out from those before and after them. And this typically means killing everything we know and love. Our childhood cartoons slaughtered behind closed doors. Ideally to make room for new beloved properties. To mixed results. This reasoning served as the catalyst for the cancellation of Billy and Mandy, the rejection of Galacticus Next Door, and likely why Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends had a finale that was just okay. I would assume they didn't have enough time to plan a massive send-off. But we're not talking about Foster's today. The talents behind these properties had to pack their bags and hit the road. Did you leave Cartoon Network because of the CN Real stuff like everybody else, or was it just like anti-deal? Um, no, I mean, I, I left for the same reason as everyone else, in that they basically made me leave. <laughs> Oh no! Uh, oh along, geez! Along with everybody else, like the that was like the whole deal was I forget who bought who at that point, but we were getting a new sort of big boss, and my bosses were like, "Yeah, we love our new boss, and you're gonna love our new boss." Like things did look great at that point. I had Underfist uh, in line to go to series, so I was pretty excited. And then uh, they just came in and they were like, "Hey, yeah, we don't like any of what we see here." <laughs> oh man! Aww. And I was like, "What's going on?" And then like my my bosses like all got who said that these bosses were great they all got let go and i was like Ugh. oh no and then no. uh, and then you know Kurt, craig and gendy left and i was like man i'm not sticking around <laughs> Now, to be fair, Stuart Snyder's legacy is actually far from a dumpster fire. Contrary to how the internet portrayed him during his time as Cartoon Network president, yes, he caused the Real. Yes, the timing of his service probably caused Chowder and Flatjet to be cut short. But not only did CN Real barely last a year, but can we really hold it against the guy when the network bounced back with Adventure Time, Regular Show, Gumball, Star Wars The Clone Wars, and so much more, all under his leadership? Regardless, the loss of Billy and Mandy was out of everyone's hands. High viewership and dedicated fans meant nothing. But I have the suspicion that if the show did continue, we would have seen it pivot a bit and shake up the status quo even further. As a certain spinoff was in the works that involved a handful of fan favorite characters, but ultimately died during the 2007 to 2008 transitional period. Thankfully, its pilot still saw the light of day as a Halloween special, one that is labeled as the series finale of the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy, but not one I accept as a conclusion. It's time to talk about Underfist. Underfist Halloween Bash is a backdoor pilot special that premiered on October 12, 2008. Picture the Avengers, but just a smidge lamer with Irwin, Hostel Gatto, General Scar, and Fred Fredberger. And Jeff the Spider. 
I can't believe I forgot Jeff. The idea of the series was that this ensemble would be employed by Billy, Mandy, and Grimm to take on the supernatural forces that plague the world. From Ensville to the ends of the earth. The pilot, Halloween Bash, sees the origin of Underfist as Erwin, who's pretty down bad, is tricked into unleashing an army of demonic candy warriors and the true antagonist of the special, Bun Bun, who's kind of just an insane marshmallow rabbit who meets a gruesome end. It's awesome. Things quickly escalate into Haas and Scar kicking ass. Fred Fredberger does Fred Fredberger things, and Erwin ends up becoming the MVP as his status as a half mummy and the powers that lie within, which obviously conflicts with Haas's presence of the team as he's a monster hunter and is actually terrified of them because of childhood trauma. But there's a happy ending, of course. Erwin gains the respect of his weird ass peers, and they end off on a note of Underfist embarking on more adventures that we never get to see because Maxwell Adams's contract with Cartoon Network expired and instead of renewing it, they basically made him leave. Which kinda sucks, because looking at what they had planned for the show, it looked like a really fun time. The credits feature concepts for numerous stories, but only the first two were confirmed to be intended episodes of the spinoff. Underfist vs. the Dinosaurs, and Underfist against the Astro Vampires. Underfist vs. the Dinosaurs would have introduced two antagonists for the series, Naughty Eris and Nice Eris. Still heartbroken from her relationship with Haas ending in the Billy and Mandy episode Chaos Theory, Eris's heart splits into two, alongside Eris herself. From there, Naughty and Nice Eris would lead an army of dinosaurs determined to prevent their own extinction, a situation that demands Underfist to travel back to prehistoric times in order to defeat them. A detailed character biography of Naughty and Nice Eris can be found on one of the few pages of the pitch bible to be released, alongside a spread of other villains. Nice Eris would strive to be the perfect girlfriend, but would only come across as a micromanaging obsessive stalker, the embodiment of smothering with love. Naughty Eris would be the stereotypical bad girl, listening to music too loud, talking back to authority, and maintains a horrible sleep schedule due to staying up all night eating ice cream and playing video games. In other words, she's the original e-girl. Another villain worth mentioning is the one who seems to be the main antagonist, Lord Melfactor, who seems as if he'd be largely shrouded in mystery. Melfactor would be the one responsible for opening up the portals to the underworld. While not much is known about his nefarious end goal, apparently he wants to vampirize the entire world, so I assume Dracula would naturally get roped into things, which makes sense as Erwin is the main character of the series. Now my issue with the Underfist Halloween Bass special as a series finale for Billy and Mandy is that, again, Billy, Mandy, and Grimm are barely relevant to the special itself. It's great to have the standout characters embark on adventures of their own. It's not great for that to supplement an actual conclusion. It sucks because there are a lot of Billy and Mandy characters that cameo in Underfist, but they don't really do anything. A true finale would incorporate all the characters we've come to know and love in creative ways, giving them their spotlight without detracting too much from the story at hand. A true finale would leave us off on a note where, even if we don't see what happens next, we're still content with the idea of never seeing another installment installment in the series for as long as we live. Counting Underfist as the series finale of Billy and Mandy is like counting the Alka Files as the series finale of Phineas and Ferb. Yeah, it was the last special to air on TV in 2015, but it was a backdoor pilot that does nothing to cap off the series. Granted, at least Phineas and Ferb did have an actual finale that aired a few months beforehand, but you know what I mean. However, the process of making this video got me thinking. I suspect Maxwell Adams had a plan with Underfist. Working on two series at the same time would not have been a foreign concept for him, so I don't doubt it would have complemented the Grim Adventures quite nicely. If anything, Underfist could have been the companion series that Evil Concarne failed to be, especially when its roster is composed of characters that the Billy and Mandy audience were invested in. Speaking of which, back to what I said a little bit ago about Billy and Mandy having to pivot if it continued alongside Underfist. With Erwin and Haas gone, Billy and Mandy loses two pretty prominent characters that have left their mark on the series, at least on paper. For all we know, Underfist could have remained as a series of hour-long specials, only premiering two or three episodes a year. That would allow for all the Underfist crew to remain in your average Billy and Mandy episode, making the fourth wall references to the spinoff because you know that's exactly the kind of joke they would crack, and breaking off into their own Underfist adventures for special event occasions. In a world where it did wind up as a weekly half-hour series, however, it It'd be strange to have those characters exist in both shows, more so, both of those status quos, at once. 
Would that force Billy and Manny to replace the roles of Erwin and Haas with characters like Nurgle Jr. and Dracula? Would we keep Billy and Manny in school? Or would the show lean more into them tagging alongside Grimm as he tackles his day-to-day -day duties? Billy and Mandy never had a shortage of unique stories, so while I don't think removing any characters that aren't these three would impact its quality, I do believe the team behind the show would have still shaken things up on a larger scale than we're used to as a result. The true potential of these two series coexisting is, of course, crossover events. Billy and Mandy always threw in random cameos and Easter eggs whenever they could. You can tell it's something Maxwell loved doing. I mean, how can we forget the Grim Adventures of the K&D? Or the fact that number three becomes the Grim Reaper in Big Boogie Adventure. You know, for a limited time, but it still happened. I couldn't see Grim Adventures or Underfist doing their own thing entirely, especially when Billy, Mandy, and Grim play a role in employing them on missions. I suspect that if things worked out, this would have been Cartoon Network's chance at the MCU before the MCU even took off. Billy and Mandy had their own zany, episodic adventures, but Underfist was poised to have somewhat of an ongoing mystery with the portals to the underworld. Imagine over the course of a season, the escapades of Underfist leads them to a supernatural force that's so powerful, they simply cannot overcome it on their own. So what do they do? Bring in Grim, Billy, and Mandy, of course, giving us an insane crossover extravaganza that results in some sort of shift in the status quo for both series. Why wouldn't they have gone for it? From a viewership standpoint, it gives people a reason to keep up with both shows. Kids would have tuned in. From a creative standpoint, it allows the team to do something new, while also retooling the franchise in a way that brings it back to its roots in Grim and Evil. Nevertheless, Stuart Snyder killed the franchise, so... I guess we'll never know. As discussed on the Pizza Party Podcast, Maxwell Adams is open to the idea of either Billy and Mandy or Under Fizz getting some kind of installment in the future. And it wouldn't hurt to inform HBO Max that you're interested in some kind of revival. Personally, I believe the only sort of revival should be one that, again, properly concludes the series. Like Hey Arnold the Jungle Movie, or to a similar extent, Samurai Jack Season 5. Though I'm not sure we need an entirely new season. And the beauty of it is, this hypothetical special doesn't need to just conclude Billy and Mandy, but conclude the Grim and Evil franchise as a whole. Billy and Mandy, Evil Con Carne, Underfist, though only one of these truly got to be a full-length series, I think it'd be nice to bring all these characters back together, giving us an insane, horrifying, action-packed journey that you can't find anywhere else. And while I'm sure Maxwell Adams could come up with a phenomenal story all on his own, I have some ideas that I would love to spitball. First off, I don't believe the art style should change at least too much. And I'm not saying this because of infamous reboots like the Powerpuff Girls or Ben 10. Nice sign, Edgelord. I'm saying that I personally would rather have a new installment that replicates the art style of the original series rather than switching things up too drastically. Take Invader Zim and the Florpus. I love this special. I honest to God hope we get more. But the entire time watching it in the back of my head, I did long for the original art style. The characters are a bit more round and smooth, instead of sharp and jagged. I would have loved to see the show's original art style, but simply produced in HD. Second, while I don't think it's a necessity, I actually would kind of be down for the characters to age up a bit, just because it's been so long, and the nostalgic audience at home will feel like the characters grew up with us. They don't need to be full-blown adults. Aging them up to, like, high school territory would be fine. Kind of like what Hey Arnold did. But I'm also just someone who finds time skips to be appealing, and in Billy and Mandy's case, not only do I think it'd be kind of funny for these characters to behave the exact same way, just taller, but it can be factored into the story as well. Take all the inconsistencies with Grimm's backstory, and again, make that the central mystery. Something happens where, yet again, we're introduced to a new variation of Grimm's childhood, which prompts Mandy to call out that Grimm and his associates have been feeding a hundred different stories of the past since the day they met Grimm. And I feel like this could lead to some really good personal stakes. Why doesn't Grimm remember what really happened? Why do different people remember different versions of the story? And of course you can bring in Underfist, who again, could come in, they've stumbled upon this big supernatural force, and they need the Grim Reaper to take care of things. This could even go hand in hand with the big mystery. And you can rope in so many characters from both Billy and Mandy and Evil Con Carne. Bring back Boscoff, bring back Major Dr. Gasly, bring back the Chocolate Sailors, bring back Fred Flintstone and Yogi Bear. The sky is the limit. All the characters who have experienced significant growth throughout the series can return. They can give us the biggest badass finale Cartoon Network has ever seen. The ending Billy and Mandy was robbed of. 
The ending we were robbed of. The ending you were robbed of. So if you want it, make some noise. Let Cartoon Network and HBO Max know. The power is in our hands. Thanks for watching, folks. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to throw it a like and subscribe. Shout out to our patrons and to Janky Bones for creating an awesome thumbnail. For more of their amazing art, you can find them on social media at Bone Janky and subscribe to their YouTube channel. The links will be down below. Rest in peace out.